Pass. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you guys for coming. It's been a long weekend for those of you who are at Black Hat as well. Long week, but uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. I want to thank Jeff Moss and his crew for doing this for the 11th year in a row. How about a big round of applause for those guys? Let's hope it never ends. Um, I'm Michael Sutton. This is my colleague, Pedro Mamini. Topic today, obviously, wireless hotspots. What are the risks and vulnerabilities surrounding them? What we'll be covering today, what we won't be covering today, uh, we'll start off with just a brief overview of what, what these hotspots are, why companies uh, think that you should pay for them, and then why they're vulnerable. We'll walk through some specific um, attack scenarios and architectures, and then we'll end up with some countermeasures that both the end user and the provider of the network can take. With that, I'll hand it over to Pedram. Everybody can hear me okay? In the back? Sounds good. Uh, before I even begin, I'd like to get all the ladies' attention up to uh, the very eligible, very successful Ralph Schindler in the front row. After the uh, conference, if everybody can just come by and give him a little pat on the back, it'd be greatly appreciated. <laughs> all right, so the purpose of our research, we, uh, we study the security of wireless ISPs from two viewpoints. That of the providers, these are the guys actually running the network, and that of the end users, the people who are utilizing these networks. Uh, we went through a variety of implementations. Mostly we found the, them at cafes and hotels. Uh, our company is located in the D.C. metro area, so that is the area that we checked out. But pretty much the companies are the same throughout the nation. The tools that we use, we had a couple laptops. Uh, we use virtual machines, but because of the inability to get low-level network access within virtual machines, we had to resurrect some older laptops as well to get Linux on it. We had a Dell Axum. This proved to be crucial. You know, you don't want to roll into a place and unpack everything just to find out that the WISP is down. It's nice to be able to detect prior to that that it's up and running. We had both Hermes and Prism chipset cards. The reason for this is that there's different drivers, different capabilities. Some tools require one chipset, others require another. Uh, the software tools that we use, mostly open source, Ethereal, TCP dump, Doug Song's uh, DSNF package. And uh, over there at the bottom, Tolerant Bladder is essential to doing WISP research as when you go through these coffee shops, you're definitely obliged to buy at least a cup of coffee, and it starts to take a toll. That's a shot of myself and my massive coffee cup at a Starbucks. Mike? Pedram mentioned the Axum that we had, and it was a crucial tool. Um, I'd like to pay tribute to that Axum. Unfortunately, it did not survive the weekend. It uh, got a crushed screen. It did not survive some Vegas partying. So. Fantastic tool, not Vegas party proof. Uh, what are these things? Why do they exist? Uh, WISP, Wireless Internet Service Provider, also known as Hotspot. Sometimes they call it a hot zone if it's a whole series of networks tied together. Um, I, I, I've heard scenarios where companies are trying to cover entire neighborhoods. I even read an article earlier, I think it was Verizon wants to actually put uh, 802.11 B access points in pay phones in Manhattan in the hopes of covering the entire city um, and providing that service to, to people who want to pay for it. Uh, it's definitely, it's taken off incredibly. Uh, it's a very successful technology, uh, but it has some serious security implications. Uh, where do these things exist? A lot, a lot of places target business travelers, things like airports, hotels, and then also just areas where you get recurring traffic cafes, things of that nature. It's often a value-added service, something that you use to get the people in there and keep them there. You know, you're, you're more likely to buy two or three cups of coffee if you're in the middle of a big download. Why, why use wireless? Why not set up a wired service for your patrons? Well, it, it's one of cost and convenience. Very, very cheap to set this up, as I'm sure most of you know. Um, we, we went to all sorts of places. The picture that you see there is probably the most bare-bones implementation you could possibly imagine. I mean, really, this is in the back of a coffee shop in Arlington, Virginia. It's, uh, that's an access point slash router up on the top shelf next to the paper towels and the coffee cups. And, and I mean, all they really did is bought a DSL line, plugged this thing in, provided it to, to their patrons. Um, so very easy to set up, very cheap. Most mobile devices nowadays come with um, Wi-Fi enabled. Most of these places use 802.11b. 
Uh, I don't think we saw any places that didn't. There's no reason, however, that I would fully expect that backward compatible 802.11g access points would start to emerge uh, as, as that becomes more prevalent. Before we dive into the fun stuff, the technical stuff, I just think it's important to look at where the industry came from because that will help us predict where it's going to go. Uh, as, as most industries do, it followed a predict predictable pattern. You know, a couple of years ago, we started to see hotspots all over the place, ton of startups, and now we're starting to see some of those go away. Joltage, unfortunately, disappeared earlier this year. Um, we're starting to see some consolidation in the industry, things of that nature. A, a sign that, uh, that it's here to stay and it's not a fad is that the big boys have arrived. Pretty much every mobile phone company, telecom company is in the industry in some way. Some of have uh, gone in on their own, like T-Mobile. You probably know they have a big contract with Starbucks. Most locations across the U.S. have wireless access now. Others have partnered. Uh, December 2002, AT&T, Intel, IBM formed a joint venture partnership called Cometa. Uh, I haven't seen a lot from them, but as I understand, they plan to roll out their stuff at some point this year. As Pedro mentioned, we chose to look at this from two standpoints when we looked at the security risks that were associated with the networks, that of the provider and also the end user. On the side of the provider, uh, there are a number of different risks. The business risks relate to the fact that most of the stores have chosen to use this as a pay-for-play method, meaning that you pay some hourly fee or a, a recurring cost, monthly cost. And obviously, if somebody can use your network for free, you're going to lose money. So there's a financial risk associated with that. And we'll walk through various scenarios whereby um, we found ways to get around the, the security that we're on these networks. Tough networks to secure because the people are on your network. You're not keeping out an outsider. You're keeping out an ins you're keeping in an insider. Um, another another risk from a business standpoint is that wireless networks are a great avenue to uh, launch an attack, and, and it's and it's tough to track down who did it. You know, you don't even have to necessarily be on the premises to to launch that attack. Later on, we'll discuss some things that you want to do to protect yourself against that. Network level attacks. No sense in diving into this right now. That, that's really, it's no different than what exists in the wired world. Lastly, denial of service attacks. If somebody can shut down your network, you're not going to be able to generate any revenue from that. Because wireless networks are fairly open, they're a little more susceptible to that sort of thing than uh, a traditional wired network. Okay, so the risk associated with being an end user on one of these networks. Uh, traditionally, administrators are concerned with securing a network on a whole. So they'll concentrate on perimeter security, firewalls, little to no emphasis is placed on node level security. Aside from antivirus, really you don't see much protection on the workstation level. So this is where the term crunchy on the outside, chewy on the inside comes from, which is not a problem when you're you know, on a natted box sitting behind a safe firewall. But now we're finding you know, corporate users taking their laptops out of this safe perimeter and you're putting them on public networks where unbeknownst to themselves there are many, many vulnerabilities. So examples of... Uh, vulnerabilities that are okay within the perimeter but not okay on untrusted networks is things like internet safe services. These are uh, personal web servers that might be insecure, anonymous FTP, maybe an open file share. People want to trade music. They want to uh, exchange files from one another. This is great behind the office doors, but you come outside and put it in a hotspot area and you know your next door neighbor can now get on your computer as well. Information leakage. Because because you're on a shared network and because anybody can get on it, there really is no point to employ WEP. If an attacker wants to get on, he can go to the coffee guy as well and get the WEP key. So it's nothing more than a hassle. So now all users are vulnerable to your basic traffic sniffing attacks, such as the plain text protocols like POP. There are spoof attacks, DNS spoofing, ARP spoofing, even spoofing of the access point itself. We'll get into this more later. And so essentially, we don't have end user awareness. You have uh, sales guys and people who just don't have a knowledge of what security is taking their computers outside of the corporate network and putting them in insecure environments. So security implementation. This is how the wireless ISP keeps you from getting on the network. Actually, this is how the authentication works. Uh, basically, four steps. Firewall restricts you. Web requests to a login screen. 
uh, authentication, and then access is granted. Can you go to the next slide? So here's a typical setup. You see user one, he's got the green arrow. He's already connected and going through the firewall to the internet. User two has just associated with an access point. Any request that he makes, he puts in google.com on a web browser, it'll be redirected to the internal web server. Uh, next screenshot. And this is an example of WISE. You put in your username and password or you sign up and access is granted, firewall uh, unrestricts you. Next slide. Next slide. So that's fine and dandy, but then how do they actually keep people who are not authenticated from getting on their network? Uh, this is like a pyramid scheme from top to bottom. Uh, everybody does IP address filtering. So when you get on this network, you're assigned an address through DHCP, and if you have not authenticated, the firewall will not allow traffic coming from you to go out. An example of this is the Wayport network. So it's easily defeated by just sniffing traffic, finding somebody who has a legitimate connection, and, and just changing your IP address to theirs. Next level up from that is a combination of IP address filtering and MAC address filtering. MAC, for those of you who don't know it, is media access control. It's an identifier burned into your, uh, either your Ethernet card or your wireless card, and it can be spoofed. Uh, T-Mobile, who's a provider for Starbucks, they do this. They have a combination of MAC and IP address uh, blocking. One step even further up from them is uh, Deep Blue Wireless has the option for IPsec VPN. So it requires a third-party client to actually get on, but this is totally secure because every single user has an encrypted tunnel to the actual gateway, and this is the ideal situation, though a hassle, so you don't see it very often. DHCP lease expiration. When we were trying to get onto the Starbucks network for free, we noticed that the DHCP lease times were very low, on, you know, on the order of like two minutes. So the initial thought was that they were actually using the computer name that goes through the DHCP lease renew packet to also verify that you know, the user hasn't been hijacked. In the end though, you know, as we were trying different things, we found that using non-statically based IP address, leaving it to DHCP, spoofing somebody's MAC address, and just sending a renew packet is all you need to do. So utilities for Windows, uh, there's SMAC, S-M-A-C, klcconsulting.com. It's a simple, it would take you two minutes. You go to a Starbucks, fire up a sniffer, see who's got a valid connection, put in their hardware address, and you're good to go. Send in a DHCP renew packet, and you're done. So actually, the lease expiration turns out to be for people who just pack up and walk out of the store to ensure they're not being charged. And actually, one thing to add to that, we found that uh, we didn't actually have to spoof both the MAC and the IP address. Um, the, because of the way it was set up, all you had to do was actually spoof the MAC address and leave it set to DHCP, and it would provide you with the appropriate IP address. So it, it was actually fairly trivial. Ahmad, can you get me a glass of water, please? <laughs> what is the guy? I think he's a king now? He's standing on stage? I'm abusing the mic power. <laughs> um, we mentioned one of the, the risks of the provider is revenue loss. So what are the scenarios whereby somebody can bypass the controls to get network access when they're not authenticated? Three scenarios that we, that we decided we could try and, and all were successful, and we'll d explain how we did them. The first, we, we noticed that on some networks, not all networks, but some, um, Wayport was a particularly um, good example of this. We, we will shit on Wayport throughout this presentation. Um, they, they are at the bottom when it comes to security. Um, and they're actually a pretty big provider. They have, they have contracts with a lot of hotels. Nobody in here is actually from Wayport, is there? Yeah. Anybody here? Am I offending anyone? All right. Good. Carry yeah. on. Um, Tunneling data through unfiltered protocols. As I mentioned, in certain cases, some but not all protocols were filtered. Uh, TCP was always blocked for obvious reasons. Most people are going to use this network to surf the web. Uh, but some networks did not follow the cardinal rule of firewalls, block everything. I can't believe you actually did that. They did not follow the cardinal rule of, of block everything, you know, deny everything, and then only allow through what is required. Um, we found scenarios where, for example, UDP port 53 was allowed because they were permitting external DNS traffic before you had authenticated. And we also found that there were scenarios where all ICMP traffic was allowed through so that you could ping external hosts. And I'm sure that when they were designing the network, they did not, you know, I mean, ICMP has legitimate purposes, but they didn't think of this scenario. What we found is, actually, I'm going to jump ahead to the slides 
but there is also connection hijacking, meaning that you kick somebody off the network, and connection sharing. The, the scenario of tunneling, um, what we used to do this was a tool called Loki. Uh, it's a great tool. It's not new. It's very old, actually. I think September of 1997, it was released in a FRAC article, uh, but it, it did the trick for what we were trying to do. Basically, it was a two-part tool, a uh, client piece and a server piece. So this is not a, an attack that you can do on the fly. You actually would have to plan ahead for something like this. But you, you set up the Loki server at some external location on the internet. Basically, it's sitting there listening on a particular port for I, ICMP traffic, but it understands that what it's receiving is an encapsulated packet with something else inside it. So you use the Loki client. In, in the scenario that we actually set up, what we were trying to do was create an SSH session to a box that was out on the internet. So we had that box out there. Then we had the Loki server set up at a different location. And then we had the client inside the network. And we were not authenticated at that point. We used the Loki client to encapsulate the SSH traffic, which was then permitted through the firewall. It, I'm following the green lines here from the bottom up. That reached the Loki server because it was not blocked at the firewall. The Loki server understands that this needs to be de-encapsulated. Then the SSH traffic is in there, and it just forwards it onto the server, the uh, remote server. And then the reverse happens on the way back. So we were able to bypass uh, the authentication by using that scenario. Obviously, you couldn't do this on the fly. You know, what would be a, a scenario where you would want to do something like this? Let's say you're at a conference in Vegas. Let's call it DEF CON. You, uh, you know that your, your hotel, besides charging an exorbitant rate for the, for the hotel itself and the fact that they're going to rape you at the blackjack tables, they also want to charge you for your internet access. So you could set up your Loki server back home before you come for your access. Connection hijacking. Pedram walked through this with, um, with the T-Mobile example in Starbucks. Um, actually, every one of the networks that we looked at were susceptible to this at some level. Either some, some just simply all you needed to do was to spoof an IP address of a legitimate user. In other cases, it was also required MAC address spoofing. The scenario starting off, attack box has not paid for access. Target box has. How do you find the target box? Again, relatively easy. Sniff some traffic. Look for, look for a box that is not the gateway and not an obvious server on the network. Chances are that's, uh, that's a legitimately connected box. Look around the room. See who you're about to screw. Then the spoofing of the IP address or the MAC address takes place. Um, Initially, when we thought about this, we assumed that it would be necessary to conduct a denial of service on the target uh, because otherwise you're going to have two identical boxes on the network. It, it's sort of an interesting thing that came out of it. Um, we found that that's not necessarily the case. Uh, if, you, if you're using a Windows box to do the attack, Windows is very fussy about um, if it ever sees somebody that's the same box because it sees the same MAC address or IP address, it'll just not communicate on the network. Um, a Unix box is much less fussy. So we found that when we were using a Unix box for the attack, spot, for the attack box and that the target was a Windows box, um, the, the target, the Windows box, would just shut itself down as soon as it saw the other IP address that was identical, but the attack box would keep right on going. So the denial of service wasn't even necessary in that scenario. Um, if a denial of service was necessary, something like AirJack could be used. This is similar to the Poink attack. It was released like four years ago. I remember it was my freshman year of college. And uh, people would utilize it actually. Just send out a packet from you know every single IP address on the subnet. It knocks everybody off and all the bandwidth becomes yours. Connection sharing is the last scenario that we looked at. Um, this is pretty basic. There's not a great deal that a provider could do to protect against this. This is just a situation where a group of users collude to buy one account and, and share it. And really, one box is just being set up as a router that the others are using as their gateway, and they're, and they're accessing the internet by paying one time. There are ways to detect this. There is a, I've read some theoretical paper on how to detect the number of NATed machines behind a single IP address. 
But really, it's so much work involved that it's not worth it at all. All right, so network level attacks against clients. Uh, of course, there's traffic monitoring, passive attack. It's low hanging fruit. Uh, it's difficult to detect. There are tools out there that can try, anti sniff, for example. Uh, you've got the spoofing attacks, you know, DNS hijacking. This is an active attack. It is plausible to detect. You need third party software to do so. It allows you to do man in the middle attacks. So things like SSL, SSH, you can circumvent this if you can. Essentially, what's happening is when a DNS request is made, because you, the attacker, are closer to the target than the actual DNS server is, you can send out a reply faster than it can. And the first answer that the target retrieves, that is the resolution that's going to use. So uh, one interesting uh, twist on this is I thought of uh, auto-update hijacking. It's a lot of Windows software like Winamp, AOL, that periodically will check for an update, or on uh, sign-on, they'll check for an update. It's very plausible to spoof the actual DNS address, set up a website or whatever protocol it uses that to check for an update, fake that, and give your own binary that the user may or may not, sometimes even automatic, download and run. Of course, that could be a Trojan. Public IP addresses, again, Wayport. Wayport is the only company out there that did not use NATed addresses. In this day and age of you know lack of IPv4 address availability, these guys are giving every one of their clients a publicly addressable IP, which of course means that now they're susceptible to remote attacks. An attacker can figure out the subnet ranges that Wayport is giving out and attack these insecure users from the comfort of his own home. The last thing is uh, ARP spoofing. ARP is the address resolution protocol. Uh, active attack, also detectable. Cisco has a, uh, Cisco switches can actually detect this and shut off ports that they detect uh, duplicate MAC addresses on. So what we found here was something interesting is network crossover. I'll get into ARP in a second. So here's a sample layout of Wayport. Uh, we have two boxes, the Linux box .168, Windows box .169, publicly addressable IPs. Uh, they go through a series of access points through a gateway that's .129. And then apparently what occurs is there are Wayport servers off-site that are periodically checking or uh, polling the, both the access points and the gateway through SNMP, maybe to see if they're up maybe to uh, update something or for some auditing. We don't know. We can't tell. But when you ARP spoof, here is a, uh, this is a screenshot of, it's actually a video. It's going to show ARP spoofing. This is Etherreal running, the top and the bottom left. The bottom right is a shell to Linux box. It's going to do the actual ARP spoofing. See the route dash N, just pull out the gateway IP. And we're pretending that we are the new gateway IP. So what's happening is when a computer wants to send traffic to dot .129, if it has never done so before, it'll send out an ARP request asking, hey, who has the hardware address for this IP address? And of course, with our ARP spoofer, we're answering, we are the legitimate uh, MAC address. So the traffic you're seeing is just all normal traffic right now. This is what you would see if you were to sniff on the wireless network. Uh, it's a shared environment, like you're on a hub. So this is just public traffic all on the wireless side. Uh, if you can skip. What happens after a while is the ARP spoofing starts to kick in and machines all of a sudden become convinced that we are the new gateway. And what we'll start to see is actual SNMP packets coming from the internet going to these, uh, these boxes. And you'll see it right there, SNMP response. You probably can't read it from the back. <laughs> these SNMP responses are coming from the Wayport network and they actually have the read-write community string which is uh, now gives us full control over their gateway, over their access points. I mean, we can do basically whatever we want here. Interesting piece of information is uh, within their MIB tables, they actually leave a very, very descriptive uh, sys.location field. So I've seen things like uh, you know access point located behind the pickle jar, next to the janitor's closet, you know behind the broom. And so a savvy social engineer can actually use this kind of information to uh, score some uh, free hardware. Little. Uh, Hard hat, utility belt, business suit, clipboard. Pick yourself up some uh, some free gear from Wayport. Next slide. Nobody wrote down that uh, community string, correct? Yeah, for the feds, bedroom would be available in the parking lot afterward. <laughs> so denial of service attacks. Uh, this is really silly. I mean, you can't protect against these, but just for shits and giggles. Uh, on the physical layer, you can always uh, put out 2.4 gigahertz noise. There was a light bulb developed by some company, a small company in Maryland. They got bought out by 3Com, but then they canned the project. It was a low consumption light bulb. One single light bulb could actually knock out wireless for like a two mile radius. 
I don't know if anybody remembers this. I tried to pick one up. I could not find it. It's actually very interesting, though. They were originally going to put it in street lamps, which would have put an end to the wireless days. So thankfully, that, that didn't work out. On the data layer, you have, again, ARP spoofing. As you spoof the gateway, uh, if you're not forwarding traffic, everybody is sending it through you. And since you're not forwarding, it's not going anywhere. It's a dead end. It's another way to keep people from getting on the network. And uh, on the network layer, this utility is like AirJack. AirJack works by it's abusing uh, 802.11 management frames. So because they're, uh, you know, they're not authenticated by any means, you can send out disso frames. You can send out deauthentication frames and just knock people off the wireless network. And if you do this fast enough, the person will never get on again. Yeah, we're flying through this, so we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, end user countermeasures. Uh, what can both the end user do to protect themselves and what can the provider do to protect, protect themselves? We'll start out with the end user. Number one rule here is that this is an untrusted network. This should be viewed in the same light as you have a box just out on the internet, no firewall, unprotected. You do not control this network. You do not know anything about the security procedures, policies, whatever, in place on this network. It has to be treated as an absolute 100% untrusted network. So implement the, your own security to the extent possible. This is especially critical if, you're, if you have uh, corporate users that are using this network you know, they have boxes with sensitive information or they're communicating sensitive information via email and other methods. Um, and, and, and you're extremely vulnerable. Um, also, something that's not on this list is end user awareness. 95% of what we talked about today, the average user does not understand, should not understand. It's not, you know, they, they have a, their own role to play in the company. They're not meant to be a security expert. So as a system administrator, you have to be the one who takes responsibility for doing your best to protect their machines and educate them that you know this these networks are, are vulnerable and you have to take care. First of all, VPN. That, that's honestly a bit of a no-brainer. Do not rely on the encryption that they are employing if they are at all. Chances are they're not. Um, if you if you put a set up a a VPN and then have your users access their email or the corporate network or whatever over that scenario, then obviously you are then in control of the encryption that is in place. Keep in mind, however, whenever you're using encryption, whether it's VPN or you're setting up an SSL connection, SSH, whatever, also you need to validate those certificates to ensure that there's no man in the middle attack that's taking place. On the VPN, though, uh, there are two crucial pieces of information. When you're connecting to a VPN, if you're connecting through a DNS name, taboo. Somebody can spoof it. You can connect to the wrong VPN. It should be a hard-coded IP address. And also on that note, uh, there is an option in Windows VPN to route all traffic through the remote VPN router. This should be enabled. That way, anything that you're sending, whether it's to Google or your corporate network, is going through the encrypted tunnel. Um, OS hardening. Typically, we think of that at the server level. We don't think of it at the client level. Actually, a lot of the things that we'll talk about for countermeasures, historically, people would have thought you only do that on a server. Um, now that we have so many mobile devices and things do not stay inside your corporate network, you really need to start you know, taking those same kind of security precautions for all of your hardware. I mean, the, the historical view of security at the corporate level is that you build this great moat around your company with a big high wall and alligators and all that stuff, and nobody can touch you because there's no way in. Well, that's useless with mobile hardware because the, the assets that that fortress is meant to protect no longer exist inside the fortress. They're out at Starbucks and, and the airport and the coffee shop. So they're completely vulnerable. So we as corporations really need to start taking a different view of security and move it from the network level to the node level. Um, so OS hardening should be done for all machines. We all know that a default Windows box has a tremendous number of ports that are open and available. If, if you're not using it, shut it down. Node level firewalls, IDSs, again, typically we've thought of that as a server side security measure. We, in this day and age, you would not set up a box for one of your users without virus protection. Node level firewall, I really think that you should view that in the same light. Uh, there's some great products out there, free products, things like Zone Alarm. You know, use that stuff. I, I think 
hopefully within the next couple of years people will recognize that and you know it'll that'll get installed on the machine right after virus protection one other scenario that we that we thought of I, I don't know if this is practical for everyone is to just establish dedicated travel hardware for some of your uh, corporate users have a box that is a stripped down box it has no sensitive information on it if your employee simply needs it to access, for example, their email or some other corporate resources. Have that as an imaged box that you can wipe clean when it comes back. You do not want to take that box and put it back on the corporate network because you don't know what's happened to it. It could have been compromised while it was out on one of these other networks. Um, and just loan that out. I mean, that's a shared, shared piece of hardware. What we talked about in the last slide was what the what can be done for the end users? What about for the provider of the hotspot? Keep in mind that you know this is a coffee shop. The, the guy who pours your coffee is not a, a security expert. If he was, he probably wouldn't be pouring your coffee. Um, but you know, they they shouldn't be that. They they're really placing a lot of reliance on these companies that are offering up the solution to implement that level of security. And as we've seen today. Uh, in many cases, those those companies have failed in, in their promise to do so. So, what can what can be done to improve the security on those networks? Number one, non non internet addressable IP addresses. Why Wayport chose not to do that, I have no idea. That's an absolutely ridiculous thing. Um, you're exposing the clients on your network not only to attacks on that network, but to the internet as a whole. I just I find that phenomenal. Number two, filter all protocols. Again, going back to the golden rule of, of firewalls, if you don't need it to be passed through, um, block it and then only allow through what's needed. That will prevent the tunneling attacks. 802.1x, for those who may not be familiar, is an authentication protocol. Uh, it's going to be part of 802.11i if they ever get around to releasing that. Um, it, it, it's a good thing. It, it has the potential to greatly enhance security because you cannot access the network. You're not authenticated to the network to do some of these attacks until until you go through the authentication process. Um, the problem with it today is one of compatibility. Not all clients are capable of handling it. Newer versions of uh, Windows, for example, Windows XP has it built in, but older older editions do not. Uh, over time, I suspect that we'll see that go away, and, and I think that likely we'll see a lot more of 802.1x. Intrusion detection systems, now we're talking on the network side, not the client side. Uh, when, when we first thought about this, I actually thought it was kind of ridiculous. I mean, big deal. You, you implement an IDS. By the time you go and look at those logs, the guy who did the bad stuff is long gone. He's not coming back. Who cares? But as we thought about it more and more, I actually think it is a very important part of security on some of these networks. If you remember earlier, we talked about the fact that uh, wireless networks are great launch pads for attacks because you don't even need to be there to do it. This at least gives you an audit trail of what took place so that you can figure out um, you know, where your security broke down. You can provide that information to the authorities. So I definitely think that an, uh, an appropriate IDS system is, is viable for any of these hotspots. Intrusion prevention system. I, I haven't seen a scenario where, whereby an IPS was implemented in a hotspot. It's still kind of an emerging new thing, but um, it makes a lot of sense to me if somebody's able to appropriately implement that, because then you're able to take take it from a detective control in the case of an IDS to a preventive control and actually do something about it, kick the person off the network if they're not not behaving nicely. Uh, with that, we're open to questions. Uh, the guys from DEF CON gave us some cool prizes, so if you have uh, some interesting questions, give some stuff away. We'll open it up to the audience. Way at the back. Actually, Pedro, you want to be the, the runner? Out, yeah. He'll, he'll take a microphone out to you so that we can actually hear the question. Wait, wait at the back, Pedro. Oh, is that the guy you chose? You yeah. Work out? That's the chosen one. It better be good. On the, uh, the Loki uh, scenario you gave there, can you, can you hold the mic just a little bit closer? Thank On that Loki scenario you yeah. gave up there, if you already have you have an IP address to get to that Loki server from the Loki client, aren't you already authenticated? What are you what are you gaining by doing that? Uh, the the IP address that you have is just an, an internal um, IP address. So like you've got like a ten dot address for example, 
and you're going to be blocked at the firewall from doing anything. Like if you try to go to www.google.com, it's not going to let you out. But what it is allowing out is ICMP traffic. So you're able to take that web request or whatever you choose to use, encapsulate it in an ICMP packet and get out. So the short answer is no, you're actually not authenticated. You're just bypassing the authentication. It's not always ICMP as well. A couple of people use external DNS servers. So they, you know, DNS port, uh, you know, UDP port 53 is allowed out as well. So you can tunnel over that. The difference is that the firewall is actually blocking you. Since you haven't authenticated with the server, your IP address is being blocked. So you could steal the connection of the guy who's actually paid for it, or you can tunnel through the protocols that are unfiltered. There's a difference between a firewall that denies all by default and denies none by default. I live off of uh, Connecticut Avenue in the district, so I'm out near near where you're at. Yeah. I was just curious if you were aware of any of the uh, the honeypots put up by some uh, particular uh, um, companies there, and if you're aware of any of their research, um, studying folks checking out wireless access points. Um, I, I've certainly read about some of the honeypots that are people are implementing. I think it's a really neat idea. Um, I think it's still kind of an experimental thing, but yeah, it's important. I mean, that way we can help learn about the attacks that are out there. I, I just I don't know how seriously people are using it at this point, that's all. Yeah, go ahead. Hey, what, <clears throat> what about the human element? Like, did any of the staff at the places look over your shoulder and see what you were doing, or? Yeah, I, I mean, that's a great question. Because we, I mean, we were kind of mean. Sometimes we'd, like, talk our way into the back room because we wanted to see the hardware and stuff. And, and yeah, that's really important. I mean, um, for example, when we went to Starbucks, they had a very strict corporate policy. They would not let us take any pictures of their hardware, and and good for them. I mean, that's completely the way it should be. Other other places, you know, that were just more one-off coffee shops, they, they were just, you know, it was no big deal. But, yeah, the, the education of your people, absolutely vital. That's a great question. But you know what? Even with Starbucks, uh, all we have to do is obtain a green apron, and that was the end of that rule as well. Green apron, khaki pants, black shirt, Starbucks uniform. Okay, I've got a question. Um, you've looked at it from a WISP point of view. What about, you know, you've got a legitimate account so that you can wander around and use various WISP. What do you tell people to do to help protect themselves from the WISP stupidity? I think the best thing to do is to stick with the VPN solution. Again, as mentioned before, make sure you're using a static IP address to connect. Ensure that you're routing all traffic through the VPN. Aside from that, there really is no way to protect against network level attacks. Uh, if somebody's spoofing you, generally, if you check your certs, you can find that out. I also, I thought the Schmoo Group made a great point yesterday in their presentation. Why are we paying for this stuff? You know, use this as a, as a value-added service to attract your, your patrons to come into your establishment and stay there. Um, you know, and I hope it changes. A qu question over here. Have you guys actually bumped up against the uh, 802.1x uh, networks out there or looked at the, uh, some of the uh, defensive uh, wireless networks like Air Defense or Air Magnet? Um, I haven't seen that stuff on any of the hotspots, so the short answer is no. We really have not have not tested that stuff. Go ahead. Yeah, have you seen any uh, companies using uh, like Peep or uh, Leap for authentication onto uh, uh, some of these networks, like in hotels? Um, I haven't seen it yet. I think that goes back to like the 802.1x stuff. It's like a, an issue of, of compatibility. I think that um, what I would like to see is sort of optional levels of security, you know, for the for the end user who doesn't really care about security, is not knowledgeable about it, they just go on with the traditional username and password. For those that are more knowledgeable, don't don't mind downloading a client or already have, you know, a client that can handle that sort of stuff, that they have that as an option. But but no, I haven't. The, the best thing that we saw was the, um, Deep Blue, I think, was the company where they had, like, the optional IPsec VPN. Um, uh, I think in it... In this current time, I think that's probably a, a great scenario, and I, hopefully we'll see 802.1x come out as, as time goes on. All right. Uh, hey, I got some quick advocacy to do here really quick. All I got to do is I got to say paper boys, pizza delivery boys, 
Uh, you guys can get a 37 decibel uh, card set up for about 160 bucks, and uh, pretty much, I mean, that's it. I mean, just, hold on. I mean, you, ah, ah, fuck it. Stage fright. Fuck it. I think what you're saying is there are other options out there. Absolutely a fair statement here. Go ahead. Uh, a lot of smaller companies don't provide VPN. Do you think services such as a nominizer? Uh, oh, a lot of smaller companies don't provide uh, services like VPN. Do you think uh, services that a nominizer would provide would help? Um, not really, because I mean that's just gonna, you know, mask what you're looking at and stuff. It's it's not gonna help you to do things like connect to the corporate resources and and actually look you know, get your email, things like that. Uh, I mean, there, there's some pretty inexpensive VPN solutions. You know, operating systems now have it built in. So I think I think companies, no matter how big or small, really need to look at implementing that kind of stuff. Adrian, where'd you go, man? I lost you. Yes. I think you took uh, it. It's been my experience that it... Do I need to stand up? It's It's been my experience that often physical security is much easier to compromise than the network. Uh, for example, most APs have got an additional Cat5 jack on the back, and it's pretty simple just to walk in, plug in your own access point to that, and hide it behind the shelf. What kind of measures have you looked at to provide better physical security? Because most employees will look at it, and they'll see a new box there. Oh, I guess that's supposed to be there like uh, locked uh, wire boxes or something like that? Yeah, I mean, no different than the wired world. You still have to have the physical security in place. You also have to have the end user awareness. I mean, if, if hardware doesn't belong there, people should, should know about it. Actually, um, some guys, uh, Starbucks actually locks their stuff up in a cabinet. So not all of them do. Hold on, Pedro, I got one over here. Yeah, from the uh, hotspots and stuff um, nowadays with um, people getting an IP on there, if you're going to attack other networks, if you're going to use it for um, the uh, file sharing, things of that nature, and then have the RIA against you and everything, what you know, wouldn't they need to protect themselves as a business from those legal liabilities, from that kind of stuff happening? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, that's the whole reason why I think things like having an IDS so that you can actually have a record of what took place on your network, um, you know, protect yourself. because it, And it's not just people coming into your establishment and using your network. I mean, keep in mind, you know, you can't, the wireless network that you set up does not end where your walls end. Um, chances are it's out in the parking lot, wherever. So it's really tough to, to protect yourself against that. But, you know, when the lawsuits happen, uh, the guy who conducted the attack isn't around. The lawyers are going to go after the deep pocket. So do what you can to keep the audit trails and, and have something there to, uh, to be able to show. Given the relative difficulty of, uh, and cost of securing wireless networks, do you think that there is a, um, a, any commercial viability to pay for play uh, commercial wireless uh, network providers at all in the long term? I. I don't like the, the idea of it. I mean, if I were running a company, I, I don't think that you're going to make enough money off of it. I think that what you are going to do is make money off of how it's going to attract people to your business. As I said, I kind of said it jokingly that, you know, you're going to drink more coffee if you're, if you're sitting there surfing the web. But it, it's serious. I, I mean, I will. I'm more likely to go to a place. I'm more likely to be there. And as there are more and more options for for mobile access, I don't see how you're going to be, get away with charging for it. So I think, you know, be proactive and use it in a different different way. Have you done any experimentation with with uh, setting it up to hijack and route the traffic out through there so that you don't just bounce the poor Windows user off, but you continue to route his traffic as well as yours, um, natting him behind the thing, just so that you're, you don't have, you don't bounce somebody off and, and create... Um, a bigger visibility for yourself. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. The only problem is, though, that you're using their IP address. So, I mean, you both have it, so that I don't think there would be a way to, to route it. What's that? Is it? I, I think it would be a really cool scenario because, yeah, the downside to what to what we're doing there is that, you know, you're blocking the person. In, in a scenario where I, we, we also had scenarios where we would, the, both the target and the attack box were Unix boxes. And in that case, um, 
we were actually able to use both at the same time because they didn't get fussy about the fact that there were two uh, identical IP addresses. And, um, you know, I mean, you're, you, a wired network, wireless network is like a hub. I mean, it's just broadcasting traffic, so the network didn't really care either. Um, but chances are if you're attacking somebody, they're not using a Unix box on that network. But so uh, have Interesting you, scenario. You stumped me on that one, so you get a price. Have, have you, uh, have you uh, found the uh, TCP IP over DNS flaw that Starbucks T-Mobile network has? No, tell me about it. Okay, so for all of you out there that like Starbucks just enough to uh, rip them off, um, if you have uh, NTSX, it was uh, proof of concept software for people that use the free Microsoft dial-up in Europe to uh, get software patches. It works with uh, Yahoo dial-up when you go to, uh, to grab the dial-up numbers. It also works with uh, Starbucks T-Mobile networks. You can actually roam from wireless network to wireless network because it works by sending TCP over DNS. And um, the way that it works is allowed out because they have recursive name queries through their name server. So their firewall will actually pass your tunnel through their network. So every Starbucks is an open wireless network. And you can tunnel SSH over it. And your tunnels won't die when you move to Starbucks to Starbucks, surf and sip network to surf and sip network, and Wi-Fi network, you know, A and B. So Did, did you indicate there was a tool that could be used? Or it's, it's just a vulnerability? It's called NTSX. NTSX. It's the name server transfer protocol. All right, cool. Thanks a lot. I think we're actually. I think we're out of time. I think I think we should wrap it up. We'll, we're gonna head into like the chill out area. If you guys have further questions, if you guys want business cards or whatever, stop by. Um, thanks a lot for coming. This was a lot of fun. <laughs>